Well, Pete, let's start with Mercury. It's a morning object uh, this month, best seen low in the southeast, but it's not terribly good really at all until the end of the month when it becomes fairly well separated from the sun, but very low down. It's got it's a bit of a problem actually, isn't it? Because it's actually um, it's it's brightening as we as time goes on, but it's actually dropping further south <laughs> below the ecliptic, which makes it hard to see. Um, but it reaches greatest western elongation on the twenty fourth of March, which is is pretty good one actually. It's 27.8 degrees. Yes, that's, that's about as good as it gets for Mercury. On the other hand, the other inferior planet is dominating our evening skies, visible in the west after sunset. This is the planet Venus, and it really is a beacon at the moment. It's completely unmistakable. It's absolutely beautiful. We should explain that it's called an inferior planet, not because it's worse no, than that's ours. Right. Not because we think of it any less, it's simply because it's closer to the sun than it's we are. It's got a smaller orbit than the Earth, that's yes. right. Um, but yeah, it's shining away at magnitude minus 4.1. That's incredible. That's it is, like it is. And I believe it can cast shadows, although I've never seen that myself. I, I have add. photographed shadows I know cast you by have. Venus. You have I have seen them as well. Right. Um, I do um, speciality flights sometimes where we turn all the lights off inside the cabin to, to actually stargaze. And... Uh, on one occasion, Venus was up, and I can remember seeing the shadow creeping across the um, the front wall, the bit which separates the the main cabin from the gal galley. And you could see it actually directly. There wasn't any uh, any mistaking that at That's all. That's quite remarkable. Hopefully, one day I shall see that. That's, that's something to look forward to. Now, we have something very special happening with regards to Venus. Um, this occurs on the 27th of March when dichotomy occurs for Venus. This is when it appears to be 50% illuminated. It looks precisely like a half moon. But, of course, because of Venus's atmosphere, the Schroeter effect, actual 50% will occur earlier. So if you're looking telescopically, you should look a few days before, around the 25th, 26th of March, and you'll notice the cosmic happens then. When you look on the 27th, it, it wouldn't be unusual to see a slightly concave terminator. Okay, so, so, so how are you measuring the 50%? That's 50% by diameter. That's 50% by diameter, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it, we think the Schroeder effect is due to the thick atmosphere of Venus and that blue light is scattered more than red light and this is the reason for this phenomena. Um, but it shows up really well in filters actually. If you uh, put a blue filter on, so, so if you look on the side of your uh, optical filter, it's got numbers on it, something like a Rattan 47 or, or even um, a light blue filter like a Rattan 80, um, the, the, uh, the dichotomy will curl even earlier because it really? happens much earlier in oh, blue that's light. So it's quite a nice thing to watch out for. Well, the other good thing with Venus, of course, is that, I mean, it's, if I'm honest, it's a difficult planet through a telescope because the, the, any markings are very subtle. It's, it's actually one of the, if you've got, and this has been measured, if you're more sensitive to the bluer end of the spectrum, they're easier to see. Right. Uh, and, you can, and we can see this in, 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 in images. For example, seen this in yours, Pete, when you've taken UV images as opposed to infrared images. In the red, there's hardly any features at all, but in the, in the violet, the, the cloud features are really very it's, strong. It's tricky in that respect as well because a lot of um, telescopes which have got front lenses, so refractors and uh, catadioptic, telescopes like Schmidt Cassegrains and yes. Max Sutops, they often have coatings on which are extremely good at getting rid of the UV or cutting oh, the no. UV out. <laughs> so it means that you can't see the markings on Venus very well. A really good type of telescope to use is one which got an open front, so a reflector is This ideal. is why I only ever use Newtonians. They are wonderful oh, why things. did I say that? <laughs> so basically, there's, there's that's a, a good thing to look out for, but it, it can be tricky. But the other thing uh, is that Venus is so bright, it's a beautiful target to see with the naked eye, or if you have a camera with just a very wide angle lens. And what's happening uh, towards the end of the month is that Venus is tracking across the sky towards the Pleiades. And as you get towards the very end of the month, so you've got the 28th of March, you've got a beautiful 16% lit waxing crescent moon, just 7.2 degrees south of the planet. And that will be there with Venus and the Pleiades. So that's a great photographic target. That'll be very, very... That'll be, that's not just a photographic uh, opportunity. That's actually also quite pretty to see. Uh, they are quite striking, these things, when they happen in the night sky and you get this grouping of objects. Yes, absolutely. OK, so we've spent a bit of time with the inferior planets, Mercury and Venus. What about heading further out into the solar system? So let's have a look at Mars, for example. Yes, this is going to be a good year for Mars, for us, for UK observers, because opposition occurs... 
uh, in September and the planet will be high in the sky. Yeah. But now the planet has passed its five arc second uh, limit for me. And I don't normally start observing Mars until it's five arc seconds across. Uh, so now we can begin in earnest studying the surface of Mars. So you can see some detail at five arc you seconds. You can, uh, yeah. Especially I've, uh, we've got an 18 inch telescope or larger. Um, you need some good seeing. But yeah, particularly prominent features like the Certus Major. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be, this is going to be a good year for Mars. I'm very excited. I do love observing Mars. Mars is, it's an infuriating planet. I do love imaging it but when it's low it can be quite tricky yes. to get much out of it and last last time it came to opposition I remember getting all excited about it and then a massive dust storm quite unexpected <laughs> dust storm actually <laughs> came up and it covered everything up yeah do you remember it was something like a month before we went out to the Lowell Observatory to observe Mars together it was just suddenly blew up and it was very unusual because it wasn't when we were supposed to be getting dust storms no. on Mars Thanks, so Mars. This, this is why Mars is worth observing because it always always expect the unexpected expected with it. <laughs> well it's a bit low down at the moment because it's in, in the lowest part of the ecliptic um, so it doesn't get very high in our skies but if you go out on the 20th um, you'll find that Jupiter which is currently at magnitude minus 1.9 is only 43 arc minutes to the north of Mars so that would be quite a, a decent pairing although Mars isn't actually that bright at the moment it's about plus 0.9. So. Yeah and that's actually quite faint for Mars so it, it just looks like an inconspicuous orange star at yeah. the moment well we've got, and on the 26th of course we've got um we've got magnitude plus 0.9 saturn plus 0.8 mars got a little bit brighter there and minus two jupiter will all sit together in a triangular formation um, so that should be pretty good to look for. It's not, I like that when you go out in the morning and you, or in the evening and you see those planets there and you look at them throughout the course of a month. It's amazing how quickly their pattern changes. It is, and how quickly they're moving through the sky. Um, unfortunately, Jupiter and Saturn are still low down. We're going to have to wait till later in the year before they uh, become a bit better targets to observe. Um, Uranus, well, it's an evening planet, but... Uh, it's becoming more compromised. It's harder, yeah, yeah, it's harder to see. Now, uh, Neptune is not visible this month no. because it's in conjunction with the Sun. So that completes the solar system. <laughs> that was a rather quick tour of the outer solar system there. What about uh, special events? Well, we've got a number of things happening. Um, on the second, we've got the first quarter moon sitting just to the east of the V-shaped Hyades open cluster. It's quite interesting when that happens because it's a difficult thing to see the stars and the moon together. But when it's a first quarter, you probably have stand a chance at least. Yeah, um, if it's anything more than that, it's the the glare as well. It just not washes just the them out, doesn't it? The glare. This is very very difficult to see even with binoculars. But yes, you're right. First quarter, this is a a good chance to have a go at it. Yes, and on the fourth, we've got the clear obscure effect known as the jeweled handle, which is visible. Now, this is a clear obscure effect is a trick of the light and shadow on the moon, and uh, it creates a a. A view of something which looks familiar. Now the jeweled handle is actually when the morning um, light, the dawn lunar light, hits the top of the Jura Mountains, which is that semicircular mountain range that goes around Sinus Iridum, and it catches the the top of those peaks, and it looks like an arc of light heading off into the Terminator. Um, so it's visible in the afternoon actually when the, the moon is up and it's still daylight so about 1620 UT look, look for the moon around then and um, even though it's day, daytime you should be able to see it hanging off the Terminator the jeweled handle. No, oh, I shall have to have a look for that. I actually have never seen it. <laughs> really? No, I've seen images of it, but I've never actually... It's one of those things, the moment you plan to do something with a lunar observation, uh, it's a, it can become incredibly hard, because you've got to have the phase right and the libration. Uh, and in actual fact, you add up how many clear nights we get in a year, it actually can become quite difficult That's, to It's do. a very good point, actually, because a lot of these clear obscure effects are time dependent and you think well that's ridiculous because they happen every month yes they do but they can happen when the moon is below the horizon which isn't very useful no and then the weather gets in the way well that's more frequently the case and, and then you realize that the actual number of times you have an opportunity to see them isn't quite as great as you thought no so it's and it might be once a month and then you've got to wait until the next lunation before you can have another go Okay, so on the 9th of um, March, we've got a full moon, which occurs at 1748 UT. Definition of full moon is, is quite interesting as well, um, because 
the way you calculate the full, it's an instant in time, basically, and it's when the ecliptic longitude position of the moon and the sun are 180 degrees apart. Anyway. It only happens for an instant. It only time. happens for an instant, but this one will occur very close to perigee, so that means that it will be slightly larger and brighter than uh, a moon which doesn't occur at perigee. But noticing that, because there's no comparison, you can't really remember what full moon looked like last month if you were lucky enough to... Well, they would have been there. close to perigee anyway. So, so. It's, it's, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a very small increase. It's not, you're not going to go out and be dazzled by a, a no, that's right. bright that's right. full moon. Well, as we get towards the end of the month, then, we've got the start of British summertime. Uh, Is he going to boo? Yes, he nearly did boo that. Um, which comes in on the 29th. I have a really accurate uh, radio clock in my observatory, but it, it moves forward, so it keeps British summertime in summer. And you could be out there. So typically, when you've just made a variable star or estimate and you need the time, you look across, and then the clock face is whizzing round and round <laughs> because it's resetting itself for British summertime. So there you have oh. it, everybody. Um, they actually <laughs> put the clocks forward and back just to annoy Paul Abel. I think as they do. I can't think of any other reason why anyone would do it. <laughs> and it works. OK, well, right at the very end of the month, there's another clear obscure effect. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one. It's called the uh, the face in Albategnius. No, I'm beginning to wonder whether you're just inventing some of these, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is quite an interesting one because it's on the um, on the 31st of March. And you can, if you get a, a view of the moon and you see the, um, the crater, you can often see well, if you've got a good imagination, where the, the rim shadow falls on the crater floor, it creates the profile of a human face. Well, OK. All right. So <laughs> it doesn't sound convinced, No, but okay. I, I, I guess seeing is believing. I'll, uh, I'll have to get up and have a look and, and have a look and see that for myself. OK, well, let's now head out into the stars. And it's an interesting time of year, isn't it? Because we've got the Northern Hemisphere spring equinox, which takes place. Well, I say it takes place. This is another instant in time. It's when the, the centre of the sun crosses the celestial equator, yes. heading from the southern half of the sky to the northern half of the sky. And that occurs at the instant of 0350 UT on the 20th of March. But it, it also, this is the time of year when the, the declination of the sun is increasing at its fastest rate. Yeah, and you, this is where you really notice it because... The in the light, evening and in the really, morning. Yeah, they yeah. really start pulling out then after this. You really do notice this sort of a almost exponential increase. And of course, is that transitional time where you've got the winter constellations loitering around in the west and then the, the spring and summer constellations it's, coming There's up. an interesting effect there because, I mean, Orion, everybody loves Orion. Do you, you've never met anybody that doesn't like Orion. No, right, I guess Orion. it could happen. So you're looking at Orion and you sort of go through January and February and you think, right, OK, I'm going to have a really good time looking at Orion, going to get take my time now. And then as you come to March, it just goes quickly, it's, it just yeah, disappears. It, it flees into the twilight. And that's because of this increase in, yeah. the, in the twilight glare just coming up to meet Orion. So he's, his days are numbered now. Um, so, yeah, so we're losing the... They're, they're quite... In your face, aren't they, the constellations of, of winter? They're very striking. Very they striking. dominate the night sky. The uh, the spring constellations are much more subtle, but I think they are still distinctive. So, for, for example, let's take Leo. It does have a very, very distinctive pattern. You've got that backward question mark shape. The sickle. The sickle, yes. which is uh, quite, quite, uh, um, quite a striking feature. With a uh, dot marked by Regulus. Yeah, I, but I, I, I think it's a lovely constellation, Leo. And one of those few constellations that does look like what it's meant to. It does look kind of look like a cat sitting in profile. Yes, or as my Sky at Night colleague once described to me, which ruined it completely, it looks like a, a mouse pointing the other way with the sickle being the curled tail of the mouse. OK, so you've spoiled it for me now. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, well, you can still see Orion for a while before he gets completely engulfed by the evening twilight. Um, but if you draw a line from the star in the bottom right of the main pattern, that's the southwest, which is the blue supergiant star Rigel, through the star in the opposite corner of the main pattern, that's the upper left or the, the northeast, uh, which is Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant star, extend that line for about one and a half times, you come to a pair of stars which look quite similar in appearance. The northern one is Castor and the southern one is Pollux and they're the head, or they represent the heads, of the, the heavenly twins, Gemini. So 
the, the the actual bodies of the twins do look like stick figures. They do look like stick figures, but they're on their side. They're heading back towards Orion. Yeah. So, but it's uh, again a nice nice constellation. Some nice open clusters uh, in Gemini as well. Yes, there are. There's M thirty five, which is beauty. So some there's a good stuff, and it's easy. I think it is fairly. But fairly easy to see in the night sky. It's fairly well, the easy. Well, the two main stars stand out pretty well, although they aren't actually identical, are they? When you when you look at them carefully, you notice that uh, Pollux is slightly brighter. Yes. And it's slightly more orangey in colour as right. well. Yeah, it's slightly more orange than the So uh, that's quite interesting. But you can use the twins and you can use Regulus, which is the star at the bottom of the, the backward question mark, to find another lovely deep sky object. So you draw a line from Castor to Regulus, and about halfway along that line, there is the beehive cluster, Messier 44. Yes, this is a lovely object. Um, I do. I, it's one of those things I do when when the when the business of observing the planets of variable stars is done in the evening. I'll have a little deep sky tour, and if if cancer's about, I'll have a look at M44. So, as everyone knows, of course, Charles Messier drew up this catalogue of objects so that people wouldn't confuse them with comets. I don't know how anybody could confuse M44, a stellar cluster, with a comet. It it does. Well, it gets worse, doesn't it? Because M45, which is the Pleiades, <laughs> how does that look like a comet? It just, there's no way you could ever confuse use that as a... Well, the rumour ha has it that he sort of tried to bump up the numbers oh. because there was a competing catalogue. So you've got a, a couple of slightly Spurious dodgy ones, in, ones there. in there. There are yeah. actually quite a few dodgy ones, aren't there? There's, there's uh, is it M40 as well, which is just a pair of stars in um, <laughs> Ursa Major? Well, any of the open clusters as well. I mean, you couldn't really confuse that with the comet. Some of them do look a bit comet -tree. Very, very few. <laughs> oh, you're a doubting Thomas. But the, um, yeah, so that you're right, M44 uh, beehive cluster, or Praesepi it's also called, isn't it? it sits in the centre of the inverted Y-shaped constellation of Cancer the Crab, which isn't particularly impressive itself, I have to say. Um, the moon, by the way, will pass th through the northern portion of um, M44 on the evening of the 6th of March. That's quite a tricky thing to observe. Um, it's quite an interesting thing to try and photograph because the, the contrast between the bright moon, which is an 88% waxing gibbous moon, so it's going to be very bright, and the faint cluster stars is quite dramatic. Yeah. So you can, you can do it, but it's uh, an interesting exercise to have a go. But there's another lovely cluster, which often gets overlooked, actually, in oh, Cancer, yes. which is M67. It is. And that sits near to the Alpha Star of Cancer, which isn't particularly bright, um, and that's called Acubans, the Alpha Star. Um, but it's an ancient cluster. It's much fainter than M44, much more com condensed. It does look a little bit like a loose globular cluster, It actually. does indeed, yes. Um, but it's very old. It's estimated to be between three and five billion years old, which actually puts its formation in a similar range to our own sun, 4.6 billion years or so. And for a while it was thought the sun may have actually been born in that cluster. Oh, and they migrated away for it as, as we moved Yeah, because there's about a hundred stars there which are similar in composition So maybe to that was star. the birthplace of the sun. Yeah, although it's thought not to be the case anymore. Oh, so. right, so now no, it's just a curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, no, that's, that's very interesting, isn't it? But um, we can finish off with, I wouldn't say it's a favourite constellation, it's just... Just I, I a was, constellation. <laughs> I just find it interesting, because below Cancer, there is a very distinctive sideways teardrop pattern, which is the head of Hydra, the water snake. Yeah, and it's mostly made of a very, very faint star stretched over a Hydra, large yes. part of the sky. Well, it takes, from the UK, it takes about nine hours to fully rise above the horizon. And that's like nine hours of nothing since there's practically nothing in it. <laughs> <laughs> Still, we've plenty to see in the March skies, so clear skies to everybody, and I hope everyone finds some time to do some observing. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Paul.